Hey everyone, it's Ron Johnson, and this is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Excited I got my voice back. Spent a week in Colorado for softball, so of course, it's a Mission Monday. Got Dontarius Thomas joining me on the Hanging Ron Johnson segment. But first, we got to talk about the most intriguing players. ESPN had some storylines of 10 players that they think are going to really shape this football season. The next 365 days are going to be about these players. Of course, Stefan Diggs is on that list, but you also have Russell Wilson. You got Jared Goff. Why? Because of the Detroit Lions. You got uh, Watson. You got Adams. Devontae Adams, that is, because of the receiver situation and what are the Oakland Raiders going to look like. And then, of course, you got Russell Wilson because are they going to win? Luke and I are going to discuss our three top Viking stories, but we're going to pick one. And I mean Luke for real. Sam Ekstrom is out today, people. Luke's in the big chair. I'm Ron Johnson, and we got that coming up next. Locked on Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. Now the Ron Johnson Show. On the field, in the broadcast booth, Ron Johnson is Minnesota sports. He's played with them, hung out with them, and grown up with all the big names in Minnesota sports. They're hanging out with Ron Johnson. It's the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Sports Minnesota podcast. And it starts now. Hey everyone, I'm Ron Johnson. This is the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Thankful for all the listeners, the O's joining us on YouTube. Hey, I'm looking good today, I know, but my voice is sounding bad. It's a little bit raspy because I spent a week in Colorado for so- a five-day softball event. Eight days in Colorado, five days of softball. So, of course, my voice is a little, uh, a little hoarse, but it's a Mission Monday. What is our mission today? We're going to find out which Viking stories are going to lead this season. The next 365 days are going to be shaped by these Vikings players. We're going to jump into them. Uh, But before we do that, I want everybody to know, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of Locked On. Just visit FanDuel.com backslash locked on to make every moment more and i'll say this i know there's not a ton of sports going on but there is a lot of baseball there are some golf out there because when i was in colorado i was able to see on the app and actually play some wagers parlays are the best thing to do for baseball it's a lot it's a long shot but when they hit it makes it fun to keep track of who actually hit home because you can pick like four guys that you think are going to hit a home run in that night or in that two day or three day span and you can win some big money because it's a long shot. Those are the fun ones to do. But as I bring my producer to the show, Luke Ekstrom, Luke is uh, joining us today in in, in absence of uh, Sam Ekstrom. Luke, I want to thank you for joining me today, man. And so we're going to jump right into this. Luke, you had some some ESPN storylines and you kind of came up with your own idea. What What's your idea? Ron, so ESPN, if you haven't seen it already, came out with an article this morning ranking the 10 most intriguing players and storylines in 2023. You already mentioned a few names at the top. Russell Wilson, can him and Sean Payton turn things around in Denver? Jared Goff on the list in the NFC North. Lions are the sexy pick to make some noise in the NFC. Now Goff has Hen and Hooker breathing down his shoulders. I figured we could take a Viking circle to this and pick our three most intriguing Vikings players. I'm curious who's on your list for the three most intriguing Viking storylines in 2023. Well, Luke, you know what? You're the guest. I'm going to let you give me your three and then jump into one. Kirk Cousins, right? Boy, we talk about him a lot. Will he stay or will he go? We're going to be talking about that again in 2024. Daniil Hunter, we've talked about a lot. He's got to be on my list. Will he stay or will he go in 2023? A little bit more pressing issue this offseason. And then Alexander Madison, the guy finally gets his 15 minutes of fame now with Dalvin Cook gone. A lot of fans have been awfully curious what this guy can do if ever given the lion's share of touches, given the opportunity for an entire season. He's finally got that shot now, Ron. He's never gotten more than 134 carries in a season. That was in 2021. Now there's 303 touches left on the plate, left behind by Dalvin Cook for Alexander Madison to soak up. So Vikes clearly want to go to that running back by committee rotation. We talk about that so much on the show. That's clearly the blueprint in the NFL now when you look at the past 10 Super Bowl winners. I'm just awfully curious about Madison and if KOC can get more efficiency from this run game when he's already gone on record saying that was a huge priority for him this offseason. Here's a wild stat, and then I'll let you go, Ron. 
as good as the Vikings offense was last year, they ranked in the bottom three in time of possession. So clearly KOC wants to figure out how to have more long sustaining drives, limit those three and outs. That means winning on first and second down by running the ball better with a guy like Madison. A lot of pressure on him to be the uh, full-time starter now on an offense that's apparently supposed to be top five in the league, Ron. Yeah, I, I love those storylines. Uh, yes, I think Kirk is going to always dominate. Neil, if he leaves, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, Alexander Madison, I, that's one on my list. So that's where our 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 sales become osmosis for those that grew up in the uh, the, the middle school uh, chemistry class. I think it was biology, maybe. Uh, but but through osmosis. Our, our three people have merged. Uh, mine as well as Alexander Madison. I agree with everything you said. I want to see him, though, in the screen game. I think when you can clear out with Jordan Addison and Justin Jefferson and K.J. Osborne, uh, and then you got T.J. Hawkinson even, that's a lot less people to deal with to break a screen. you got five linemen on five uh, guys, maybe one guy to beat. I'm going with Alexander Madison, so we'll be, we'll be interested to see that. He doesn't have the top-end speed that we know of like Dalvin Cook. But my, mine are Josh Metellus, Alexander Madison, and then, of course, you got a Caleb Evans. I like Alexander – or, sorry, I like Josh Metellus in this one. Uh, the reason why Josh Metellus might dominate the next 365 days is where does he fit in this offense – or, sorry, this defense. But here's the kicker. And him and the Caleb Evans, to me, are kind of 1A and 1B. Caleb Evans is, is, is QB – or, sorry, CB2. My, I'm a deep dive Brian Flores, though. I think Brian Flores is going to dominate the next 365 days. I, I kind of went off script. It's not a player, it's a coach, uh, but I think Brian Flores is going to dominate the next 365 days because every single defensive stat is going to be drilled down. If he has the same type of season as Ed Donatel, people are going to lose their mind. We did all this stuff to change coaches. We hear all how great the Brian Flores defense is. This is one thing I'll say. With the Miami Dolphins, Luke, he wasn't great right away, and that's what people forget. People thought the defense was great right away. It wasn't. It took him a year to then finally the next year start to jail that defense. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if it does, this is not a like – people. I, th I think people feel like the Super Bowl is now or never, and it could be for some teams, but I think sometimes for in order to win a Super Bowl and understand what that means, you have to do so much to get the right pieces to the puzzle. So much. Sometimes it could be a small piece. Sometimes it could be a big piece. Uh, like with the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1978, my dad was their first round pick. He was the rookie of the year. So clearly he helps. He was the defensive rookie of the year. Uh, so when you think about Justin Jefferson being the offensive rookie of the year, so on and so forth, Devontae Adams being the rookie of the year, my dad was the defensive rookie of the year. Uh, I think my mom or my sister have the trophy. I don't know why I didn't keep the trophy, but I think one of my, my sister and my mom has it. Um, but it was the, and then back then I think it was like sponsored by Coca Cola. That did not help Pittsburgh, or sorry, that did not make Pittsburgh a Super Bowl champion in 78, 79, but it helped. And so when I look at the pieces that were added this year, there's uh, you look at Jordan Addison. I'm not going to say if they win a Super Bowl, it was Jordan Addison, but maybe he's that first round pick piece to the puzzle that really makes this offense go. Um, you think about Mel Blunt, Donnie Shell, my dad at the other corner, uh, had like four, I think four or five interceptions that year, which got him rookie of the year. Think about those interceptions with me and Joe Green, Jack Hambert, or sorry, Jack Lambert, Jack Ham. Again, still curtain was already there. It had already been created, uh, like I think a couple years before, but then he joined it and helped it become stronger. Terry Bradshaw uh, had a great season. So again, the Vikings reverse. I don't think it's going to be the defense. It's going to be the offense with Jordan Addison, but that Jordan Addison pick can add to the Brian Flores defense. You're on the off on the field longer. And so I think that's where Flo is going to really – uh, show us what he's made of. Like, show us what you got, little mama. That's the Jay-Z song, for those that don't know. Um, but maybe that's the song. Show us what you got, Brian Flores. Show us what you got. Hey, hey. I mean, hey, if anybody wants to steal that song, just know June or July 3rd, the Ron Johnson Show said it first about <laughs> show us what you got, Brian Flores. Because, I mean, I'm saying, Luke, like, there's been a lot of stuff we said here first, and then people run with it on TV, and they act like they, it, it, I mean, was their idea the whole time. Not to say people watch us to the point where we're out there, you know, still in headlines, but I was the first person to say Dalvin Cook should go to the Jets because we did that show, and then all of a sudden, Tyler Conklin gets on TV. He petitions for Dalvin Cook, and everybody's loving the Jets and Dalvin Cook now, and, oh, there's room, and, oh, the salary cap, and, oh, uh, Brees Hall. I already said all that. We said all that, Luke, but you know what? It's not about that, but I want to thank all the people on uh, Amazon Fire and Roku as well that continue to download, watch, subscribe our show. Uh, we love We love all of you.
Thank you. Those that get it on iTunes, Spotify, iHeartMedia, wherever you get your podcast, we're thankful that you joined the Ron Johnson Show and made us your first listen. Uh, if you're looking for another listen, check out the Minnesota Football Party. Some great stuff. Thursdays for sure. I'm on there. I always have a long uh, analogy or some type of – like I, I merge a movie with my sports talk. I don't know. I love movies. Uh, but, Luke, quick one before we get out of here for you. When you think about – because we got Don Terrius Thomas joining us in the Hang Around Johnson segment coming up next. Uh, Don Terrius sits down and talks about the love boat. He did bring that up. He talked about the love boat. He talked about Mike Tyson, uh, why he got fired. There's a lot of stuff Don Terrius can tell us about. But the love boat conversation with Don Terrius, I was very surprised at where he went with that one because he's like, yeah, man, we all got in the locker room. And everybody's like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can't tell you what he said. You just got to check it out. Um, so some good stuff there. Uh, but, Luke, when, when you think about this team and, and you say Alexander Madison, if Alexander Madison, because I've, I've thrown some stats out there about running backs in the Super Bowl, most of the Super Bowl winning running backs, I think the biggest one, and I don't have the stat book with me, it's in my bag somewhere, but was like 700 yards, I think. If Alexander Madison goes for six to 700 yards versus 1,000, but the Vikings make it to the NFC, uh, what are we, North? No, it's not a North. N sorry, NFC. They win NFC North, but they go to the NFC Championship. Can we still consider that a failure? We should have had Dalvin Cook. Do you think people are going to say, oh, if we had Dalvin Cook, we might have won the Super Bowl? Luke? Absolutely not, Ron. I mean, it's a team game at the end of the day, right? We all know that. Stats only matter at the end of your career when you rack them all up. Madison putting up six to 700 yards, that also means there's a running back by committee and guys like Correct. Ty Chandler, Ken A, the rookie Dwayne McBride, they're all going to be in the mix as well. Helping the team win, become more efficient, running the ball, eliminating those third and longs for Kirk Cousins that he struggled with so often during the late half of the season. So I certainly think if it means more W's at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what stats get put up there as long as they go further in the NFC. I think you're right. Well, 365 days domination of Alexander Madison. I'm going to go with Brian Flores. We'll see how this season plays out. I'm looking. It's July, people. That means we're about 20-ish days from players jumping on planes, heading back to Minneapolis. And checking into the Omni in Egan, getting ready for training camp that's going to happen that week. That means 20 days left, people, before we have no football to talk about. And then we get to talk about football. But coming up next on the Hang Around Johnson segment, we got Don Terrace Thomas. Before we do that, we got a word from our sponsors. Thanks, Ron. Quick reminder, this show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, as we are each and every day during the thick of the summer season here on the Ron Johnson Show. Baseball season in full swing. No better place to get in on all the action than at FanDuel. Money lines, parlays, prop bets. You want it, they got it. FanDuel's got everything you need to bet on the entire MLB season. Twins, by the way, taking on the Royals. New three-game series tonight right in the backyard. Target field, Joe Ryan on the mound. Current line, Twins minus 220. You can bet that and plenty more over at FanDuel.com slash locked on. And make sure you check out the No Sweat First Bet. Up to $1,000 in bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Download the easy-to-use FanDuel app. Get your winnings instantly. Check it out today. FanDuel.com slash locked on. Major League Baseball trademarks used with permission. Well, now it's time for the Hangover Ron Johnson segment with Don Terrius Thomas, former Minnesota Viking, but also University of Auburn. Uh, Don Terrius was recently in town for the Minnesota Vikings golf tournament. We got a chance to meet, connect. And, uh, you know, I'm all about energy. And I saw his sunglasses. And we end up getting the same ones, the Oakleys. I don't have them in here with me, but uh, I'm definitely taking them to my daughter's game in Colorado because I will tell you, people, those sunglasses are rally. Like the first day I wore the sunglasses, my daughter's team did okay. Uh, I wore the sunglasses day two of the tournament. Day three, they killed it. Um, you know, they got it out of their slump. So I'm, I'm big on superstition. So now uh, they call me the swaggy dad now because I, I wear the, uh, the the big sunglasses. But I saw Don Terry's running around like, this has got to be a cool dude, man. And I got to talking to Tracy, uh, who is uh, Tracy McDonald. She's the uh, Vikings alumni affairs person. And, uh, you know, I always like to make sure I'm dealing with guys that are legit, not no, uh, no, no you know, boneheads or, you know, and Don Terry seemed like a good dude, man, but, but former linebacker for the Minnesota Vikings, man. Thank you for joining me on the Hanging Around Johnson segment. Uh, when you think about your time with the Minnesota Vikings coming from Auburn, thrown into the frozen tundra, uh, what were some of your first memories of that? Um, well, the first thing I thought about was like, man, it's going to be cold up there. <laughs> so I was worried about the weather. I remember coming in, um, you know, doing our rookie meeting camp and all that. And I was asking a question. One of the questions I asked was the guys was, Hey, if this starts snowing, so, that, I mean, we practice council, like, you know, 
we're going to be able to sit. They was like, nah, you'll be able to get here, man. Like, they'll get the roads clear. But um, it was a exciting time, Um, you know, change. Moment, a change of moment in my life. So I was really looking forward to it. Came in with um, Coach Tice now. Um, Teddy Cottrell had some good guys, had some good veteran leaders. Um, Chris Claiborne was one of those guys, Keith Newman. Um, so I was really looking forward to it. Yeah, and, and, and thinking about that time, you know, 2004, 2005, uh, but, you know, some, some, some decent Vikings teams back then. What, what are some, like, memories of like some of the the big moments or the the big times in those seasons that you know you always kind of go back to like man that was crazy that happened um well I always go back to my rookie year when we um made the playoff um we had to play the Green Bay Packers who was all you know divisional um rivals and you know we lost to them in a in the regular season both times on the last second field goal and it <laughs> those things where it was like man we just got was it a last second like did you guys make the field i mean did you guys miss the field goal or did they make it they I know, made okay so yeah <laughs> but it was one of those like man we i know we could just get over this hump but anyway we had to see them in the, on the playoffs um so that was you know we had to go there that when we had randy moss on the infamous moon in the, the fans <laughs> um game and you know it was just a different energy it was just something about you know we all came together it was like hey man we can do this and you know we went out there and and actually did a great job put a pretty um being on him. Uh, I think Brett Favre threw like three interceptions. Um it was my one of the hits that I got on Brett Favre, got a good shot on him. But that that whole atmosphere was just just something different. So I always go back to that, you know, one of they I remember when we got in the playoffs, because we lost our last game and that we and Coach Tyson announced that we still got in the playoffs and people were saying, Oh, we backed our way into the to the playoffs. And uh, we was going to be a first-round knockout, you know, had to go against the, a team that uh, beat us twice. But, you know, we we had the confidence. And, we, like I said, we had some good leaders on the team that, you know, stepped up and we was able to get it done going to Green Bay and beating them boys. So, Yeah, and when you, you, you were part of the mooning. So when yeah. Randy Moss did the moon after he scored, like what, what was your thought right when you saw it? Or, you know, did you even know it happened? I didn't even know it happened. And <laughs> it happened, you know. Uh, we found out we was all laughing, joking. You know, it was just one of those like, man, we was happy we won. You know, we came in, um, got over that hump to beat our division rivals. So um, it wasn't nothing too crazy. It was just like, well, that's Randy Moss, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> we just pulled on from it. And in 2005, man, I got to bring it up, man. You, you know, you were on the team with the alleged, you know, boat party and everything that happened, and you know all the stuff, man. Like walking into that locker room. I won't even ask because I know I, I'm not. I'm, we, I'm not out here. We're not. I'm not. I'm not out here snitching. I'm not going to ask if you were on it. But when you got back into the locker room and everybody was kind of talking about it, the media had found out about it. Coach Tice, all the you know, everybody was talking about it. Like, what was what was some of the thought processes going through everybody's head at that moment? Um, that we need to stick together, make sure everybody's story was straight. That was the first thing. Oh, we heard. I remember Coach Tice had called a meeting with us. He was like, man, he called us that that night that it broke, said that this is about to break. So we need to make sure, like, everybody, what was going on, figure out, you know, get ahead of it before it actually hit the media or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being young, I'm still you know, only my second year. I'm nervous and, you know, worried. Then, you know, you start hearing about lawsuits and things. I'm like, oh, man. So you just kind of nervous and not sure what's going on and what's going to happen. But um, we wanted to make sure, like, everybody was on the same page, get together. Um, I remember Coach – I'm not Coach. The owner, Wilf, came in, talked to us, gave us a lashing. Um, it was nervous. It was a nervous time, you know. Some guys were unsure, like, what's going on? Like, are we going to go through a lawsuit? Is this something that's going to come back and hurt us? Um, some guys going to get suspended. What is the money, ram money ramification of it? So, um, but we was able to get through it. And, you know, pushed through and was able to, you know, put that behind us. Yeah, man. And that led to, um, you know, you were part of it. It led to Mike Tice being fired. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was it was serious. Like yeah. four players because of the crew, I guess, that saw some stuff. And, you know, the crew was, was not happy with what happened. And four players were charged with misdemeanors. And, like, it was a serious event. But yeah. you, you guys lost your coach, you know, Mike Tice. And, uh, you know, Brad Childress comes in. What was that transition like with Chili? coming from Mike Tice like was he trying to come in and put his foot down like this type of stuff is not going to happen on my watch or you know like what was that transit because we every we know like every time I hear about a new coach I hear about culture and the culture has to change 
What was Brad Childress like when he came in? Yeah, he kind of came in in that same mentality like, hey, this is not going to happen. This is a new regime. Like, this is the culture that we're going to have to get in. Everybody's going to be held at a, um, accountable. Um, be smart. Don't be out there embarrassing the program and things of that nature. And, um, you know, it was one of those shifting moments. I mean, I'm going into my third year, you know, um, trying to figure out who the D coordinator, trying to finally get my foot wet on the defense and stuff like that. So you kind of, everybody's up, you know, you start seeing people getting released. Um, veteran guys, like I said, that I was used to, that I was, thought was going to be there for a while. Um, and that line, I mean, in the linebacker core itself, let's say it was like seven of us on the roster. But when Childress came in, only, what, two made it? He, me, EJ, and then they, they brought in another, some more guys. So, you know, you did, definitely saw things shifting but you know you just have to hey it's part of business and um one thing that you learn that quick when you get into the nfl that this is a business and you got to you know take care of your own and make sure that you go out there and handle your business so that you can be on that team right and so you know he comes in tries to change the culture the year before mike tice you guys are nine and seven you know yeah. both part of year next year children's go six and ten mm -hmm. was there some like and maybe that's why guys were getting released. It, was there some internal, like, man, we got rid of Tice for this? Like, was there were there any players that kind of pushed back on Childress seeing, like, you came in and we were winning last year and now we're losing? No, I don't think I, – I never witnessed anybody getting pushed back. We know, like I said, we, we lost a lot of good veteran players. Um, they brought in some guys. Um, we knew that it would take – we had confidence in the coaches that they brought in that, you know, it was going to take some time for the system to gel and get back right and to get some more pieces – um on the team that we needed that was critical so um we all just you know you know trust and believe the process and you just got to follow through but at the end of the day you got to do your job you know you got to go out right. there and continue to perform and continue to make sure that you're that you're able to get on that team and, and um to play some football man yeah because i mean that's that's what it's about being on the team making the next steps um mm -hmm. you know and, and you played under some really good defensive coordinators you know you you had time to see uh you know leslie frazier you had time to see a lot of these guys uh what was it like you know being under leslie frazier leslie frazier was more chill um uh, but i would take i, I want to jump back i was also on a coach tumlin tumlin okay came, uh, oh yeah with his first year mike tumlin and um uh, when i tell you when he left, I'm gonna be honest. When he left to go with that took that job at um the Steelers, it was a it was kind of like man, cause we knew we had something. That like Coach Tumlin is one of those guys that knows how to you know get the team morale up and, and and get the best out of the players. And he's gonna keep it straight with you. He's not gonna sugarcoat nothing. And that's all we ask for as men. Like just just be honest and tell me what it is that needs to be done, so I can work on getting that done. But it was great working with him, uh, even though I had a brief stint only a year under him. And then no Leslie Frazier coming in. Uh, kind of similar uh, mentality, but Leslie Frazier is more more chill. Uh, he's not one of those big rah-rah guys. But he's he's very X's and O's as far as, like, putting putting the defense and getting the most out of the defense player and putting him in the right position. Um, I enjoyed my time being on him. Uh, up under here and learned a lot from him so you know it was a good smooth transition they have both have similar techniques it's just that you know sometimes they differ in the way they approach the game and how they get get the most out of players yeah it's crazy too because i mean mike tomlin clearly had built a resume before minnesota as a defensive coordinator because he was only the defensive coordinator for one season yeah. um and he went six and ten and history has him as the third least successful Defensive coordinator, Minnesota Vikings uh, history, but he did become a head coach who now is killing it with the Steelers. Uh, yeah. Probably going to be there until he wants to be done because the Steelers don't ever part ways with coaches, even in down times. Hasn't had a losing season ever yeah. as a head coach. And uh, so it, it's crazy because a lot of people said the same thing. When Mike Tomlin got on the podium as a defensive coordinator, a lot of people right away were like, man, this should be the next head coach for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, it didn't happen. They held on to Childress maybe too long. They then let Leslie Frazier take over. Uh, when Childress was let go. Um, but, yeah, a lot of people thought Mike Tomlin should have been handed the keys because they could just feel it, which you clearly, you know, you clearly oh, yeah. could feel Mike Tomlin's energy as a defensive coordinator. Um, when, when, when you talk about this team, though, the teams you've played for, the Minnesota Vikings, and now you look at the new-look Minnesota Vikings with Kevin O'Connell, um, similar where the offense kind of is the precedent, the defense is good, has a new defensive coordinator in Brian Flores, um, 
But but what what do you do you see any similarities in this Vikings team to some of the teams you played on? Um yes and no. Um I would say, like you say, I think this um they're more of an offensive driven team. Uh defense is gonna play their part. Um I, I feel the defense will, you know, come back and bounce back and be pretty good, pretty solid. Uh, Brian Flores is, is a known proven guy. I like him as uh, coming in for the defensive coordinator. Um, but, you know, for us, um, you know, Childress was an offensive guy. And I'm talking about more so with Childress. Even with Coach Tice, you know, they were more offensive head coaches. Right. But defensive guys, you know, you kind of just have to play your play your part and your pieces and, and, and go that way. But um, they have some similarities in the sense of, you know, you know the offense going to, gonna gonna perform and gonna show up you expect the offense to come perform and show up i mean when we had we had adrian peterson randy moss our offense always had that one guy that you had that the defense is on the other side had the key in and that could change the game and change the momentum and defenses we always just been solid i mean when we had um the the pat william brothers i mean said pat william boys kevin williams and pat williams yeah and, you know, we got Jerry Allen, you know, as a linebacker playing behind them. Oh, man, you love playing behind a D-line like that. And so I think up front, you know, on the defense, I think we were pretty solid. And they putting it back together. Uh, hopefully they can get Hunter uh, signed and, and get him happy and solidify that on uh, D-line up front. And But, yeah, I'm looking for – Looking, I'm looking for big things. I know they made some, some, you know, release some veteran guys such as we did when Childress first got there. Um, but, you know, they, they looking to get the pieces. I think they finding the pieces to put it back together. And um, it's going to take a process. I always, for me, uh, even at Auburn, when I came in, I was the first class for, um, to come in under my coach. And we knew that we had a process that it's going to take, i say, at least minimum two years. That once they get their guys in, get their system in, and everybody really understand the jail, that um, you can see what you really have. So, you know, I'm going to be patient. And um, hopefully the um, Vikings hope will be patient about what's going on and and um, see how this thing turns out. Yeah, and when you were at Auburn, man, like you guys were good. You guys were legit. Like you had some really good defenses. You played with Carlos Dansby. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that like? Because I, you know, I've seen I've seen pictures of you two on the front of uh, ESPN the magazine, and you know the rage and all this other stuff. And you guys were like creating havoc on defense. Uh, what was that like in that linebacker room with you and Carlos Dansby? Oh, it was it was a competition. Like to the highest level, you know, that's that's like my brother. Uh, we we encourage each other. We pushed each other. I mean, we had another guy named Mark Brown that was also that played for the Jets for a while. OK. Thorbert, who got a Super Bowl ring with the Giants. So it's in it's some guys in there, you know, that that we played together, play hard, man. Um, definitely, definitely. But I mean, we I mean, if you look at the offense that we played at or played against the Auburn. They had two of the best running backs to come out of that that, that program, Cardinal Calat Williams and Ronnie Brown. Right. Oh yeah. Those guys every day. And then people forget Brandon Jacobs were there as well. So <laughs> we so you so one thing you was gonna have to do is be physical. Like, so you're gonna have to uh, learn how to you know play, stop the run and and I say back then because now the game has changed where you know you don't see that twenty one personnel, twenty two personnel like we used to I back, but um it was a great time, you know. We competed each other. It, practice was competitive every week. I mean, it's every day at practice. So it um, pushed us to do go out to the game and, and carry that same mentality. Yeah, because I remember that. Because Cadillac Williams and uh, and Ronnie Brown, uh, they were basically like head neck and neck with Lawrence Maroney and Marion Barber, yeah. uh, two also you know NFL long time played uh, you know guys and Marion you know Lawrence Maroney first round pick. I remember I remember because Glenn Mason was kind of the first to have the two running back with thousand yards back to back, and then Cadillac Williams and Ronnie Brown came in and did it. But you guys going up against those guys in practice as linebackers, that's your like that's your guys like receivers, DBs fight. Linebackers, running backs got to compete together. Yeah. You know, how was it competing against two running backs like that? Whether it's I got to meet you in the hole and try to tackle you in a drill or just, you know, blocking drills and so on and so forth. It, it was it was great, man, because, it, you know, we're friends. We're brothers. We all keep in touch, you know, to this day, um, support each other to the fullest. But it was no love lost on that field. I was not about to let Ronnie Brown or Cadillac show me up on that field. And they was they wasn't going to do the same for me. 
and, and you know towards me. And um, another person I had to go against was Rudy Johnson, who's another oh yeah, tough running back. So it was always you know running backs that came through that program that you know, but that and and still made me better, made me a better linebacker. You yeah. know, so running back, running running Brown and Calac kind of they have different. In that style, you no know, running. Running Brown was a big boy. He's like six one, two thirty five, two forty. Ran like a four three. Cadillac is, you know, he was more like two ten, two two o five. But he he run tough. He's gonna give it to you. Running Brown was is quick. So you know, you, you get that dynamic, and it's competitive. And you know, we laugh and joke about it. Ooh, I remember. And like I said, Running Brown is my financial guy right now. Okay. Him and I. Almost came to blows on, on the field, just for just you know compete. I mean, you you know how it goes, man. You know, temper flare. You know, get you know, hot head and and you know you want to compete and you don't want to be showing up. So it, it happens. But you know they made us better and uh, hopefully we made them better as well. And then you know with Carlos Dansby, you know he was that guy, man. He he's a he's a playmaker. Something about that kid. He just knew how to be in the right position at the right time and just made plays. And he was. And he, he, I see him do something. Like, I got to do it too. So it was an all around competition that, you know, iron sharpened iron. So made us better. Yeah. Yeah. And so you were drafted to the Minnesota Vikings, second round. Uh, Carlos Dansby went right before you. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you see your boy go before you and then you go right after him, uh, you know, how, how fun or exciting was that to be able to hit him up? Like, yo, man, congrats. Like, we both made it, uh, blah, blah. And then, you know, and then you got to move on to your next career. But how cool was that? Because I know I've seen a lot of like Julius Peppers and Ryan Sims were like that. They were drafted back to back out of North Carolina. Uh, uh, LeVar Arrington and Courtney Brown were drafted back to back out of Penn State or not back to back, but pretty close mm-hmm. out of Penn State. Um, you guys had that opportunity out of Auburn. You know, that doesn't happen where two guys playing uh, besides the Miami team of 2004. That was re- or sorry, 2001, my draft class. That was ridiculous in 2002 because uh, you had Ed Reed, Philip Buchanan, Mike Rump uh, all went in the first round. So that was like just dumb. Three guys. And then Sean Taylor was who they left behind. Like it's like <laughs> what in the world was that defensive? Like that was just stupid. I mean, you had Vince Wilfork. You had – I mean, I'm yeah. not even naming the names. We all know that story of the 2002 uh, Miami Hurricanes. That just – I. I if NIL existed back then, oh, yeah. I think Miami would have had even more players. Like, oh, yeah. the way Luke was – I mean, that's why I'm surprised Miami football hasn't bounced back yet. It's coming. But we know – and maybe Luke's kind of out of the, the, the thick of things now. But if he was able to give money away back then, he did it anyway. But yeah. legally, oh, man, he would have – Miami would have had even more guys. But when you look at you and uh, Carlos Dansby having that opportunity, man, to be drafted back-to-back, um, you know, what was that like? It was awesome, man, you know, to see my brother go – you know, right at the second round, we kind of actually call those dance when I we was back in Auburn together. So we kind of like checking up on each other. You know, you see that ticker next man up. So you see him go, congratulate him. Then, um, you know, he's like, hey, man, your time coming. I never forget. He's like, your time coming. Just be patient. I'm like, all right, appreciate it, man. Yeah, I'm looking. So then all of a sudden you get off the board. And, man, it's just a great feeling, you know, um, to see that, you know, to celebrate with each other and then kind of be like, man. We did it, you know, all that hard work, you know, the long summers and the grind in the weight room and off the field and just, you know, keep, keeping our head down and it finally pays off. And, um, you know, best of luck for you in the next season, uh, you know, next part of your career. And uh, fortunate for me, me and Carlos Dansby actually met up my rookie year. He was, it was, I want to say it was a preseason game. That's when he was at Arizona. Mm-hmm. You know, we got a chance to actually my my first time seeing him play. I think like I because I was you know he on defense, I'm on defense. So instead of sitting on the bench, you know, once I get my paperwork, or, I mean, send out paperwork, get get situated on what I need to do, I you know get up and go watch him play because I want to see him perform, you know, support him. So that was a great thing to see to actually watch him play and and like I say, he had a long career, Carlos. Did a great job um, taking care of his body and just being a football player. So, but it was yeah, great. man. He did he did some stuff. A lot of guys like us pray about. Man, he made it from uh, 04 all the way to 2017, um, and, and especially at that position, mm-hmm. linebacker is one of the few positions. I mean, I played played with guys like Ray Lewis was able to play that long, but I played with a lot of other linebackers and myself too. I mean, I got hurt and I was done after three years. But a mm-hmm. lot of guys, man, they, they they your body just you know you hurt one thing. 
And then it's so hard to come back from it. Even though you come back, you're not 100%. You're just not the guy you used to be. Um, but that definitely was the thing. One last one before we get out of here, man. You were drafted again by the Minnesota Vikings. Uh, Mike Tice. A lot of people said he was a player's coach, and he definitely was. Yeah. Do you think that he was so much – because we know – like, cause we all got the we all got the Super Bowl ticket opportunity, and you can sell them at face mm -hmm. value. You can mark them up, do whatever you want to do. We heard Mike Tice got caught up, you know, yeah. overdoing it, buying players' tickets and going and reselling them to other people. Uh, but do you think Mike Tice was too much of a players' coach uh, for that type of team like the Vikings, where not say guys took advantage of it, but maybe guys just felt like, man, I know if we do something, Tice ain't really gonna punish us as bad as you know, like maybe a Tony Dungy would. Um, I don't think so, because what people don't understand, Coach Sykes was a hard. Like he was, he was tough on us out there at practice. Okay, yeah. He he would get on you and call you out in meetings. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't play that man. So he's a player's coach because he can relate to us because he played it. He played the game of football. Definitely. So a player's coach for me is like someone that can relate. Like, hey, I know y'all beat up right now, but I'm gonna need to get this out of you. I've been there. When you took, well, you go see some other coaches that ain't never done nothing, and, and they trying to get something out. Of you looking at them like, man, you don't know how I'm feeling. You don't know know what's going through my body right now. But with right. him, he did, and you know he because he knew that, and he knew when the time to pull up, pull off us, he would pull off. But when he he also knew the time to push us, he would push us. So I don't think that was that you know a bad thing that he couldn't get for uh, get us get his get it done. I mean. His last year, we did, you know, get to the playoffs and stuff. Right. So, um, but you know, that's hindsight. So, but um, I enjoyed playing for Coach Tice. He he made me, you know, he got the most out of me as far as pushing me. Uh, even when I didn't want to hear, you know, it's kind of one of those things. But you know, he's a coach, so he's a coach for us. And then you know, he'll he'll work with the player. But no, he was a great guy. Well, you heard it first from Dontarius Thomas for all the people that thought Mike Tice was a little too easy on the players, and that's why all the trouble yeah. happened. It definitely wasn't the case. Definitely wasn't the case. Um, I put it like this. Chris Rump, current defensive line coach of Minnesota Vikings, he was on with us last week. Chris Rump said it, and you guys heard it. Players are going to be players because they're grown men. It doesn't matter what we say or do. If they want to do something stupid, they're going to do it. A yeah. coach is not going to be able to control it no matter how hard you're on them. They're going to do it. Sometimes relating to them a little bit more will make them less likely which is why you have guys, these younger coaches now being very successful because they can relate just like Mike Tice. You're right. Made it to the playoffs. I don't think you should blame the off the field stuff on the coach and fire him, but hey, it's what happened because it was the media wanted it done and uh, it was the narrative and look what happened. You brought Brad Children in for no reason. Great job, but it wasn't a reason. I think Mike Tice was headed in the right direction and should have left it alone, but it is what it is. I'm Ron Johnson. That's Don Terrius Thomas, man. I want to thank you for joining me on the Hanging Ron Johnson segment, the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports Minnesota. We have a word from our sponsors. Sirius XM is a proud partner of the Ron Johnson Show on Locked On Sports, so make sure you go to the Sirius XM app, and we'll talk about that next. But coming up, we got the Daily Three. It's three questions, about two minutes each today. We're going to be back after this. Man, that Don Terry's time is uh, – I, I love the way he said all the players in the locker room said, hey, let's get our story straight for the love boat. So clearly, clearly we know the true, 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 true story is never truly going to come out until one day. I mean, we know some stories have come out. But, of course, a lot of it – people start to believe what they believe after they told each other here's what the truth is. Um, but it was bad anyway. Players got in trouble. There were some, some arrests, some fines. Uh, some, some court dates set, uh, but it was fun to hear. I mean, honestly, him talking about Mike Tice, I think that's true too. Mike Tice was a player's coach. Uh, he was really good for the players. If not for the love boat, he doesn't get fired, period. I mean, I think it was just one of those things where you got to move on from a coach that was in a bad situation, but Childress wasn't a great situation. I'm not going to say Childress was Tim Brewster, but Childress really didn't do much. I mean, he was a good coach. Uh, Leslie Frazier, I think, might have been better if he had taken on maybe a different role sooner. Uh, but it is what it is. We got to move on to the daily three because of the Dontarius Thomas interview. We're going to do about one minute each. That's three questions, one minute each. Take it away, Luke. All right, Rob. First one up on the list today. Your Minnesota Twins won two of three versus the second best team in the American League, the Baltimore Orioles, and won their first series since Rocco Baldelli held a player only meeting last week after being swept by the Braves. So is this a turning point in the twin season or is this the same old 500 twins? What do you think, Ron? Well, speaking of turning point, before we jump into that, daily three, we're going to talk about the Sirius XM app, people. The Royals 
are traveling to play the Twins at 7, 10 p.m. tonight on Sirius XM. You can get every pitch of your hometown broadcast by going to the SXM app. Just download it and search Twins. And you can listen to wherever you are. You could be working out. You could be cutting grass. That's what I'm going to be doing today, probably cutting grass. I've been gone for eight days, so i got to cut my grass. But whatever you're doing, you can download. And also on that Sirius XM app, you can also get Locked On Sports Minnesota. You can hear our show on the SXM app as well. Just go to any app market iPad, iPhone, whatever you do, but you got to have a Wi-Fi or internet connection, and you can listen to the Twins' hometown broadcast. But jumping back into the Daily Three, uh, the Twins win, uh, and and is this a turn? So now let's see this. They're even with the Guardians. Now I said this, and you guys remember this. I don't know if I said it on on, on what show. Maybe I said it on the, uh, the, the round table last time I was on, but I did say after that stretch, the Twins are going to lose to the Guardians. I felt like the Twins, and they're not losing. So maybe it's a push. They're tied. They're not below. They're not above. They're tied right now with the Guardians. Now they're into slippery waters. Now Rocco Baudet, like you said, he had a speech with the team. Maybe this is a turnaround. Uh, we know when big-time speeches happen, sometimes players take to it. We know if you go back way to the movie Major League, their big speech was about ripping off the clothes of the owner. Every time they won, they got to rip off the clothes of the owner. I don't know if Rocco Baldelli has like a picture of somebody uh, in the locker room that they're taking the clothes off of. Uh, but either way, I mean, it could be because they're upset J-Lo left the Twin Cities and mm. uh, A-Rod is not helping the Twins out. I don't know. So maybe they're trying to get back at A-Rod by having a I, – I have no idea. But whatever their idea is, whatever his speech is, I will say uh, we'll see in the next four games, especially this next three. But the next four games usually kind of tells you where the team's going to head because now they're in no man's land. They're, they're tied. And if they lose the lead, they're not going to the playoffs because every other division is way better. And so there's no way to even get in as a wild card. So uh, I, I think it might be a turnaround, but I really don't know with this team. I mean, they're tied with the Guardians, so I don't know. I don't know if a speech is good enough to do it. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, things were looking good in that first game. After the meeting, they busted out and scored eight runs, but then they finished with one run and one run in back-to-back -back games. Two runs in 18 innings, Ron. Three for 17 with runners in scoring position during that series. And they just continue to be one of the worst teams in baseball in these one-run games. So, yeah, I mean, it, it was great to see them finally take a series. First, a really good team, mind you. But until I see these bats wake up, we need some offense for multiple games in a row. This still feels like the same old twins to me, Ron. All right, yeah. number two on the list to the NFL we go. Arizona Cardinals safety Buda Baker has officially requested a trade. Should the Vikings dip their toes in the water, make a move for the Pro Bowl safety? What do you think, Ron? No, I don't think so. Um, I, I like Buda Baker early on. I tease it as a tweet, but I don't really see it being an opportunity. And I, unless you're willing to get rid of a serious asset, I don't see Buda Baker needed when you already have Cam Bynum and uh, and Harrison Smith. I don't think safety is your problem when it's, it's getting after the quarterback is your problem. If there was a big time pass rusher, um, Aaron Donald type. Maybe I would say see if you can get him, but I don't know if safety is the answer. I like Cam Bynum. I like his versatility. Uh, we know Harrison Smith is an absolute sniper, so uh, my, my quick, easy answer is no. I, I don't think the Vikings need to go after the safety. I don't know. What do you think? Here's how I look at it. I agree with you. Nobody's going to argue that it is the deepest position on the roster, but this defense needs as much talent and help anywhere and everywhere they can get it, and Brian Flores is the secret to this puzzle. He's a guy who can move guys like Harrison Smith in the box, maybe play him at linebacker. Lewis Seen's a downhill kind of guy cam bynum played quarterback in college so he's got experience if you want to put him at corner so i say yeah why not bring him in if the price is right buddha baker played a pretty 50 50 split of deep safety and box safety so he's versatile check this out ron he also lined up at inside slot cornerback over 1300 snaps in his career so I would just love to have another Swiss Army knife for Flores to deploy, especially if the asking price is a late day two or maybe even later kind of pick. Yeah. All right, last one here to the NBA we go now. Desmond Bain, did you see this? Just signed a new contract. 207 mil guaranteed money. That would rank him second in the NFL behind only Deshaun Watson still. Yet Desmond Bain, he was 39th in scoring last year. So, Ron, if you were a young athlete all over again, would you put more focus into basketball or football knowing the payout in the NBA is so much greater now? Um, I will say the payout in the NFL is still high compared to what I was getting paid when I played. Michael Jordan made $94 million in his career. And Lonzo, or no, sorry, uh, uh, Melo, LaMelo Ball, because he's a Jordan guy with the Charlotte Hornets. Um, I think he just got, got like, 300 and some or 260 million uh in his five-year deal four-year deal so Lamelo ball 
has like double tripled what Michael Jordan made in the NFL. So there's a word called inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a word called I got to and this is more than one word, um, but I got to take what I can get. And so that's what the, the NBA is dealing with right now. Like you look at Desmond Bain, not to say he's not a good player, but like I say, he's 39th. He would be, uh, let's see, if you go back in the day, I'm trying to think of a player that he would remind me of, but it would be kind of like a John Starks, like really, really good piece of the puzzle, uh, really key piece of the team. But John Starks wouldn't have got paid this money in his day. You move John Starks to this era where he's going to give you flash and pop every once in a while. He's going to get paid like Michael Jordan, but that's all because of social media. Uh, we can see it. Also, maybe the Grizzlies are like, man, we don't even know. How, like John Morant might be suspended for half the year. Uh, if he keeps playing around, he might quit. Who knows? And then you look at Dylan Brooks going to the Houston Rockets. I mean, he got paid. So it is what it is. Like this is the, this is the inflation era. It's just different. So that's the big thing with this with Desmond Bain uh, getting paid. If I were to focus, I would still focus on football. Football is my thing. I mean, I, I would – honestly, I would probably focus on golf. Like, if I could go back as a kid and be go. 10 and grab a golf club and start practicing at age 10, uh, not to say I would be super great, but maybe as an athlete, I'd be able to play in some of these ACC challenges and some of the stuff like versus Steph Curry and and, and, tra and tra uh, Travis Kelsey and uh, Aaron Rodgers and, and Adam Thielen out there in the, the ACC challenge. Uh, I would I would pick up some golf clubs, though, because it's, it's definitely one of those sports, one, uh, where if you can hit the ball and you're athletic uh, and you put the time to it, you can make a lot of money and not have to be a great player. They pay like $500,000 sometimes to the guy they got like eighth. Uh, they'll pay like, uh, I think one guy made like 120 grand on one tournament and he got like 15th because of the purse. Like, so you just don't know. And then sponsorships with golf because your face is right there. You don't have to worry about getting concussions unless somebody hits you in the head with a ball. Uh, funny story before we get out of here, my daughter's softball tournament. There was a lady, not with us, got hit in the head with a ball. She doesn't think she had a concussion, but she was, she was like, she was milking it. I'm pretty sure it hurt, but dead in the center of the head, foul ball. She wasn't paying Oof. attention, hit her Oof. top square, top of the head. Oof. We were like, oh, that's going to leave a mark. But it's a mission Monday. Our mission was successful. We found out the 365-day Vikings we're going to talk about for this year. I got Brian Flores. Luke has uh, Alexander Madison. Tomorrow, it's 4th of July, people, so enjoy the day off because we're going to take the day off. We'll be back on July 5th with a loaded show to talk a little bit more about training camp, a little bit more about the Timberwolves, and then, of course, uh, we have to talk about this baseball team. We'll see what happens tonight, and then we'll talk about it on Wednesday. But I'm Ron Johnson. That's Luke Inman joining us and remember people you can get endless vikings talk you just have to subscribe to locked on sports minnesota on youtube amazon fire roku uh iheart media spot wherever you get your podcasts just subscribe and we are going to bring you the press conference we're going to bring you the biggest news anytime something happens and also great player interviews love to talk to the players love to talk to the coaches but i'm ron johnson that's luke emman this is the ron johnson show have a great holiday people